Hi, my name is Mary Gooden, and I am a speaker, author, founder of Divine Destiny Mentoring and Publishing, and truly the CEO of what I like to call my brilliant life. And I am so excited to share a conversation with Pearl today. Hey, everybody, it's Pearl Sharonza with Women's Successful Living, and I'm so excited to bring our guest on. And she just really is living her best life, which I think is so cool. I had the honor of meeting her in person a few months back when we went to PodFest together. But today I have Mary Gooden. She is an international speaker, best-selling author, mentor and publisher, and the CEO of what she does like to call her brilliant life. She spent over a decade immersed in self-discovery, spiritual knowledge, mentoring, and sharing purpose-driven stories through her publishing house. And now Mary teaches her clients how to live their unique truth and cultivate a joy-filled life and business. Mary, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you today. Thanks, Pearl. Yes, I'm glad to see you again. I loved know. meeting you at PodFest. That was so fun. <laughs> yeah, PodFest was a great time. And if you're listening to us, if you've never heard about it, it, it was for us geeky PodFesters that, you know, we, we go on and do stuff like all the geeky, you know, uh, Comic Cons and all those other things, Mom Fest and things like that. But it was a great, I had a great time because I don't know about you, but I met some really unique and fun people. I also feel the same way. Uh, and we got to see Angel again. I love seeing Angel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Angel Angel is a blast. And did you get to meet, um, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a bit blank on her last name. Her name is Liz. She's got a curly hair. She's fun. She's actually on Survivor right now. Um, yes, if you don't watch Survivor, you just got to go watch it and find Liz. They're all merged okay. together. But she has a great um, platform as well, not just her podcast, but also helps businesses like you and I like grow and and email marketing ideas and really fun, fun stuff. So I don't know if she wins a show or not, but what I, I was like, oh, I met her at PodFest. So <laughs> it was I'm cool. going to look for that. I probably did. I just, sometimes I need to see the face yeah. because the name, you know. Yeah, her hair is a little <laughs> long. So those of you that are listening and you can't, you can't see, Liz has got, she wears glasses, little curly hair. Of course, they're all wearing bandanas, but she kind of has her own bandana. She's just a, a free spirit person. You can't miss her. So her name is Liz. But um, but anyways, back to you being on the show. I'm so excited to have you here. You know, we're kind of doing the shift with the show. We're talking a lot about soulful self-care now. And I know that is your kind of jam and, and helping people live their best life. But we all know that we start somewhere in our, our life, right, Mary? So someplace in our life as a, that little girl growing up, we had these ideas. I was talking with somebody the other day and I was like, isn't it interesting how when we're little, we have these, you know, oh, I'm going to grow up and be a teacher. I'm going to grow up and be a lawyer, right? And then we don't necessarily do exactly that, but what we are doing is somewhere in that realm of what we thought we might do. So tell us about you, Mary. Like, what was it like? What was some of those big dreams you had as that little girl? You'll love this. A star is born. I just really wanted to be a star. I had the shirt. I had the rainbow. Um, I just wanted to be joy, I think. I wanted to be bright. And I know that that's just probably, you know, I didn't want to be, a, I didn't want to be like this specific thing. Um, I wanted to just bring joy, shine light, whatever that meant. For, for that, for me, um, I was recognized as a child, just always happy, always spunky. My mom too. <laughs> I call her a creative. She was a creative. And whatever that means is just, she put her hands in everything that she wanted to try and so that's how I grew up. Uh, however, uh, as most of us will recognize, society, money, um, making a living instead of being a being a human, being a being, um, came in like a just like the wind of change came in. You have to make money. You have to do this. You have to, you know, you have to be part of this. And I really got sucked in to the corporate carnival i call it <laughs> and um i ended up just going after the money and that to me was you know how can i you know i can do anything i want uh, i believe still to this day that we create our own reality so i created the reality of being heavily in a masculine platform of working my way up to management to executive leadership to whatever the highest position i could hold for somebody else's company. For me, that was in dentistry. I started as the, the dental assistant. And within a year and a half, I opened a practice with a doctor. You know, I was a very hard charger. Uh, I'm a Leo. So anybody that follows astrology, I've got a lot of fire behind me. And I chose that. I'll, I'll 
take responsibility for choosing that life, but it was that life, um, trying to keep up, trying to, uh, really find hope and success and satisfaction in somebody else's dream. And that, uh, that's big. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I'm listening. It's, it's so true. Like I, it's interesting. You, you proved my point at the beginning too. Like you, you know, you want to have joy and be that light and that's, you know, and that's what you're doing. Like you want you, that radiant, you're doing that brilliant life now, but you're right because you know, society tells us we have to grow up, we have to get the nine to fiver, and that's what we should do, right? We didn't know. I think t in today's world, entrepreneurship is a lot is talked about a lot more than like when we grew up, right? When we grew up, it's like, oh, you're going to go to school, you're going to get married, you're going to have the nine to five job, right? And so that's that's that generational stuff that we did. That's because that's the path we thought we had to go, and then we're like, oh, wait a minute, I'm real life. There, there's something else I could do. I don't have to be, you, you know, and and for those that are listening, if you're a man, I'm sorry, but we did. We had to live in that man's world of we had to put ourselves up up the pipe of, you know, that that realm. I was blessed though. I, I worked at an amazing company. It was called Preferred Mortgage Group. I don't know what it's called today, but Jim Macklin. So if he's listening, hello, Jim. He used to tell us we weren't, we were not supposed to call him our boss. We were a team. And to this day, like I've been here in Florida almost 20 years. And to this day, he still reaches out to me. And in fact, he's coming to my younger son's wedding in October. That's like, he was the example of what the opposite of what we grew up in that man's world, right? He wanted us to do well to the point that um, when I was, let's see, Nate, I was about seven months pregnant with my youngest one. We were going to New York for a, a shower with my oldest one. We're all going out for a family shower. They wanted to give us a New York. And when I came back, I when I left, I knew I had one loan officer that was leaving. He'd already given notice. But when I came back, the other loan officer was no longer there. And I had one left and my boss was like, Okay, you're going to go cover this office over here because Chuck and I have talked and it's time you want to be a loan officer. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, seven months pregnant. They're going to be like, what are you doing? Like, you know, and he goes, no, no, no. They're going to be like a bunch of grandmas for you and that baby. And he was right. Like he knew. But what I loved about him is he wasn't the norm of like, he wanted us, especially the women in the company to like shine. He He put us out there. And if you didn't take advantage of the opportunity to shine, then you were missing out, right? And so it was really, really amazing to to be in that life. But you're right, we we didn't have that. So, you know, we it was like, how do I, you know, a lack of a better word, how do I fight up that ladder so that I can get my spot in, in the light, you know? So what what was the change? Like what what was the deciding factor? You said, enough is enough. I'm gonna go do what my passion is. Yeah. Well, it was panic. It was a panic attack, literally. It was a, my body, my heart. We're going to even go right to the organ uh, saying, stop this nonsense. <laughs> you know, I work a lot with affirmations or mantras or whatever you like to call them. I think they're powerful. Our words are so powerful. And as you were saying, Pearl, the mantra or affirmation at that time was do it like everybody else is doing it. This is the way up. This is the way to the light. And uh, so after all that chasing, uh, and it wasn't just being in that corporate environment. I was working probably, um, I was executive leader. I cared about this this man's business. And he was great too. There was a greatness to him. Uh, I always got good, great gifts and all these things. But I was putting all my eggs there 80 hours a week. And I was teaching fitness because that was part of my passion. And I was teaching the yoga. And so on top of, so it all came crumbling down, right? Because I was trying to dance with all the things and I had two young children at the time and my my heart panicked one night. I was preparing a meal for the girls. They were downstairs. I was running a bath for them. And literally I'm in my bathroom and I'm like, I'm having a freaking heart attack. And I was 36 <laughs> at the time, right? And so I, I kind of had this whole show, the fire trucks came, the ambulance came, the neighbor thankfully went and shut the bath water off. He's like, you would, he's like, I'm so glad I went over there. Uh, and I'm in the hospital, like a ticking time bomb. Like I've got to go to work tomorrow. Can we get, you know, and, and in that week, that was really the moment where I was like, Mary, you, this isn't, this isn't a joy filled life. As much as it matches and exceeds all of the boxes, this isn't joy. This isn't shining a light. And what are you teaching your daughters, for heaven's sakes? This is not why they chose you. And so 
you know, I left the hospital that night with enough Xanax to put down an elephant uh, that I didn't want to take. I'm not, I'm not a medicine taker. And I was like, this is not me. So it took me about four years to, to go through the process. And what became part of that process is what I share with everyone now as just a people, as a human, but that works in life and business is my three non-negotiables, my soul care practices. But that's what ignited that in me. So at the time I panicked, I had already been, I was a yoga teacher. I, I had already been involved in those things, but I was doing these things and I was trying to fit all these things in so I could stay at this level of superwoman. So for the women out there, the moms out there, that that that's what it brought me. But I'll, I wouldn't trade the, the, the experience. I wouldn't trade. Like I needed that. That was my awakening. That was my wake up call. Like, wait a minute, get in your body. Right. And I think that's important to recognize too, that, you know, the journeys that we go on truly lead us to where we, where we land, right? Like, like you said, it took you four more years to realize and make the steps to, to make that change, but we have to go through the journey. It's not like we just wake up and go, okay, I'm going to quit my job and be an entrepreneur. Like it's not going to work that way, right? You have to have, you need a mentor, you need a coach, there's things you need to do to set yourself up so that financially, you know, you're okay too, especially if you're, you know, the income earner, but we have to remember that We can't, I always tell my clients, life's not a remote. You can't go back and rewind, but you can learn how to, as you go bounce, as you bounce forward, as I like to call it, you can learn, you can bounce forward with what are the tools that I learn, what I want to take forward and what I want to, what I want to leave. You know, I often talk about the mountain, you know, I always often talk about pictures yourself going on this mountain as you're climbing up the mountain, you know, you got to take a break because the climb could get hard. So you stop at the scenic route, you, you sit there and you evaluate, you know, what's in your lunch pail and is everything in your lunch pail? Do you really like it? Even though you packed it? And if you didn't like it, then you're going to throw away in the trash can the stuff that is no longer serving you, right? And you're going to enjoy the meals that's, that does serve you. And then you're going to get up and you're going to do the next walk. You're going to get to the top, but you're not going to just be like, yeah, I made it. Let's go down the mountain. No, you're going to sit that mountaintop and you're going to be like, okay, what worked? What didn't work? Where do I need help at? So that I, so that as I walk down the mountain and not fall down the mountain, I can take those, those support systems with me, you know, and then you leave in the trash can up there. What didn't work? And then same thing as you come down, you stop again on the way down. You're like, oh, that might've worked on the other side of the mountain, but this isn't working here. So again, you deposit it and you eat what's going to serve you and you go down because oftentimes people think they have to climb up that mountain. I did it. And then, oh my God, everything's falling. Right. And I met this, um, this girl in one of my master classes that I'm in, um, and she calls herself a trauma accountant. And it was really, and, and I just love this, especially when you talk about self-care. I love what she said. I'm like, I want to talk to you. Like, what is a trauma accountant? Like, like, do, do I have like, am I, is my accounts on fire and I need help because the tax man's after me? Like, what is it? And she's like, no, 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 no. She said, I do accounting. She said, but what I do is I work with most entrepreneurs, get to a level of income earning. So picture that mountain, you hit that level of the mountain. You're like, I'm afraid to go down because I'm afraid what it might bring me, right? I, I know if I fall down, I'm going to get you know skin knees and stuff. But what if I don't fall down? What's it going to bring me just by walking down, right? Am I going to be tired? Am I going to be over, you know, whatever those overwhelmed? And she's like, so people get to a certain level in their income and they think they can't earn more than that level. Like, you know, I, I set the bar here. There's no way I can go here. Right. And she says, so I help them break that thought while we're doing their books. I help them see here's other ways you can earn money. Here's some other things you can do that you're already doing to bring more abundance into your life. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like, that is so cool. You know? And she also, you know, along the lines, like what I love doing in my world, she also talks about, just like I said, with the mountain, like what, childhood trauma do you need to leave behind because it's holding you back from being that you know next abundance level and i just i just i was like man that's so cool because it's so good for your self-care your way of thinking and like you said i love affirmations and mantra statements and and things like that so so tell us that you you made it a choice after those four years you made that choice and you know when you decided to step into the next what was the next part for you what what was the next thing you did after those four years so my next part, uh, what I realized is everything I, I desired, I just needed to ask for. And so by year three, I had asked to go part-time uh, and it was easily received and I didn't lose a drop of money. 
<laughs> imagine all the boundaries that you're saying. We put all these things in our way um, to prolong the process. So what one thing you said, just to quickly circle back, is it doesn't happen overnight. But what I will say is the sooner you start, the sooner you arrive. And that sometimes is where well, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. So during that three years, I started putting aside this time to do my three things, to connect with myself. Like you said, opening my lunch pail, opening my heart. What do you want? What would feel good for you? What does it look like? I called it daily connection. Right after I would do that, I would go move. So I went part time. So I opened up some mornings where I could go exercise first. I didn't have to put me last. So I slowly started practicing putting me first. So I'd connect and then I'd go move my body and I'd get some fun answers. Like, well, take, like you said, you can take inspired action here. Just like the accountant, you could do more here. You could create this. You could just be a fitness instructor. Um, but once I started expanding and opening those ideas up as available, guess what started happening? invitations to do the thing started finding me. So about three and a half years in, my sister who lives in Louisiana, which is where I have a place now, there was a small fitness club, a gym that she had been um, working at, uh, not working at, that she had been teaching at. Yeah, she became a fitness instructor after I did because she thought it was like, oh my God, you can do this? And I'm like, yes. And so we ended up buying this gym in Bouti. So I resigned I put my house on the market. I sold some things to downsize and I bought a little fitness club <laughs> to which really instigated the first part of my passion. I love seeing people thrive. I love seeing people happy when we move our bodies. It's my second non-negotiable every day, even though I have out out. I'm in the overflow. I've gone beyond the any success point that I've ever set. I still practice my three, never stop. Um, but that, I so I bought the fitness club and I went into the full-time fitness because I loved it. People are happy. They're jumping in front of me. I'm happy. I'm using my voice. I'm changing people's lives and they're telling me and I'm seeing it instead of sitting behind a desk and bossing people around. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm actually there's a reciprocation happening. And that, you know, that draws you in when people start to see you and you start to see people and you start to put yourself in places where you're joyful and there's more joy, more things open up. Was it scary to leave behind a mm. high compensated career to go into the fitness industry, which is true? You don't make a lot of money in the fitness industry, but you grow relationships and you expand and find yourself through your voice. That's a whole nother story, right? But yeah, so yeah, did I take a couple steps backwards from the financial piece? Yes. Yes, I did. Did that come back to me a hundredfold? <laughs> absolutely. As a successful 6K, uh, six-figure entrepreneur, Absolutely. I, I love that. I, I love that you said, you know, you at, like what ask for what you desire, right? Because you, you ask for it and then here you are, you know, you're selling everything in your house, you're downsizing, you're going to do this thing. And like you said, the fitness world, people think, oh, there's a lot of money in that. There's not. I, I've, I know a friend that's a personal trainer. It's like, there's, he goes, but he said the same thing you do. He goes, but the connections I make fill my soul and help me understand this is what I like to do. And because, you know, don't get me wrong. We have to have an income. We need to make certain money, but it's not always about the money that's in the bank account. It's about how do you feel on the inside? Like you said, like what's truly bringing you joy, you know, and having that, having that joyful heart is, is so, so important. And, and I love that your sister saw you doing, she's like, Oh, you know, and then you guys go together. So, so tell us about that for a few minutes. Let's talk about like, what's it oh, like being so. in, in business? Cause they always say, don't go in business with your friends and your family. Right. So tell us about that. Well, there is some points to that. We rarely, we rarely converse now a couple of years later. Um, well, how many exactly? That was 2013. So 11 years later, I don't, my sister and I, it's been a few years. My mother ascended a couple of years ago and the way that I had been handling my life and receiving so much joy 
in life um, was a big turnoff for my siblings, but I'm not going, not going to shine. I'm the youngest of four. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we did it. And she had like this Pilates piece and I was the yogi piece. And our hopes was to transition this fitness studio into yoga Pilates. You know, we had the, our dreams and ideas. She also had a very, um, she's a chemical engineer. So she had this career that could support her passion, which sometimes that's it. So I want to say that really quickly. Like you don't have to jump out of corporate. You don't have to jump out of what you're doing. All you need to do is start putting yourself in the first position and start asking and showing up for the things that you desire. And you can make these things work cohesively. Yeah, um, I, I love that you said that. That, that. And that's important for everybody listening and watching is because it's not about leaving you know, your job. It's about what are you doing that's bringing you joy so that you can enjoy going. Like some people, like they hate going to work because they're so like they're working over overwhelmed and they, they don't have time for the things that bring them joy. That's one of the things that I love to coach on when I'm working with clients is like, you know, we actually do when they, the first thing we do when they come into my realm of, of helping them is writing 10 things that bring them joy. And they're like, Oh, I can write it down. I'm like, Oh no, no, let me just tell you, it's going to take you two weeks to do this process. Cause it's not just going to be write it down. Like, I want to know, you have to keep asking yourself, well, what about that brings the joy? What about that? I said, so it's going to take you seven, at least 14 days. So if you finish in three days, I'm going to send you back just like the teacher did and say, go redo it because it's not enough. Right. And, and so it doesn't mean, like you said, that you have to leave your corporate world. However, it does mean that you can put boundaries around that nine to five or whatever that, you know, that job is for you. So that you can do the things that bring you joy, like maybe, you know, go for a staycation on that weekend that's coming up, sit on the front porch swing like I have at my front house here. You know, when you come home, instead of walking right into the house, maybe you sit in the car for 15, 20 minutes and just, you know, listen to some calming music, your favorite podcast or whatever that is, just to prepare you for the entry into the after work world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we did that. Um about three years after having, I owned my first brick and mortar. I had a small little tie dye business before that. So when I was in corporate and I loved yoga, I was making tie dye yoga pants. And that was the funnest thing I ever did. Uh, and so I had my clothes in my brick and mortar. Like, I had mats. We were doing all the things. I got my first set of sound bowls. Like I really uh, grew. And then about three years later, uh, I opened a yoga studio across the street. So we didn't shape shift this. And then the universe just started playing the role, right? If you're willing to ask and you're willing to sit with yourself, okay, my number one non-negotiable is daily connection. And every morning I do this, whether it's three seconds, three minutes, or three hours, I don't care. I'm saying, what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? What do you want? And the more that I sat with that, the more I could see, you know, I could listen and the universe could hear. And I would create my reality by taking steps because that was my first thought. Um, and so uh, I got the yoga studio and then I started realizing you're doing it again. You're, you've got two businesses now. You're doing it again. Uh, but what happened is the universe moved about six months after I opened the yoga studio. We were leasing, uh, I leased both buildings, but the gym building uh, the owners were a little tricky and this building had been used for the gym for 16 years. They decided, and I heard from one of my instructors, they were going to sell the building right out from under me. Right? So the universe was moving. I'm just telling you, I had the business, up, that business up for sale so I could focus on yoga. We moved the bikes over and we had the Pilates stuff. So we were getting what we initially desired in another space across the street. And um, they did that. And what happened was the price tag that I had on the business, I ended up having to sell all the equipment and I made um, a third more than what I had priced the business at. <laughs> right? So even though you would think things aren't working in your favor, they are. So I opened the yoga studio. All right, hold on to your bobby socks. The yoga studio helped me go through what ended up a divorce. I ended up divorced after a 25-year marriage. After choosing more choosing me became like non-recognizable. We weren't quite connected anymore. And so that was a blessing too. But all of my dreams started to come true. And I had this stage, this yoga stage where I could, I could help others walk through their emotions. I could lead the way. I could help others change their perspective on life, their perception. 
um, then Sedona opened up. So then I started hosting retreats and I had a community to invite retreats to. Like the whole thing started to to expand, like a portal opened up in ways that I had, I didn't even see coming. Like I just, I just wanted the yoga studio. And then I, okay, so long story short, I ended up with a place. I have my own place in Sedona now. And um, all of this, what all of this did for me, because how are you a publisher? How did you end up as an an entrepreneur, a business uh, mentor and publisher? All of that part of my life gave me my first story in a multi-author book. As 2020 came in, I was doing the meditations. I met a woman because I was so engaged in meditations. I had just gotten back from Sedona. All these pieces, all these little pieces. Um, she invited me to a book. At first I said, I don't have a story. And then when I said yes anyway, because, you know, we do that. We, we get scared, right? We get scared of things we don't see, foresee or things we've never done. Yet when you're living in a place where I live, one, two, three, daily connection, daily commitment to me, daily movement, daily celebration, you start understanding that the invitations are the invitations and they're all going to feel new because you're asking for something new. They're all going to be something you've never said yes to before. And they're going to dangle in your face like, say yes to me, even though you don't know what this looks like. So I tried to say no, and I quickly said yes. And as I was writing my story, I realized this is big for me, that everything up until that moment had happened so I could write this story. I'm serious. <laughs> I think you're, yeah. I didn't mute twice. I said, so let's talk about that a second because I, you know, I go like tonight when we're done, I get to go and have the honor of coaching at a nonprofit for some amazing women who are between homelessness and, you know, finding their bouncing forwards to their next spot. And I get to pour into them. I do coaching with them. They can come online and do coaching with me as well. And I tell each and every one of them, like, you guys, you have a story, even though you think you don't, you have a story. And even if you don't, so for those that are listening, even if you don't want to publish it, you have a story. And, and, you know, I tell those ladies, I'm like, listen, when you leave the house, it would be a beautiful thing if you could write a letter to that person who's going to put her head in the bed you're getting out of today, you know, and, and leave them a note of encouragement, you know, and I'm, I really like instill, try to instill that in them. And so, you know, because I tell them you have, we all have a story, you know, I, I've now, I'm in my, I think my sixth or seventh book in a series called Everyday Women. And we talk about different things from finding our, you know, finding our why to, finding, you know, time for making time for self-care and all the, all those things that are important to fill our cup and let it overflow. And I love that, like you said, you, you realize at first you said, no, I, you know, I don't have a story. And then when you started writing it, you're like, I have a story. Like it's, you know, it's powerful. And, and here's the thing, I don't know if it happened with you. Um, we'll delve a little bit more in a few minutes. I have a couple other questions to ask you, but when we start writing our story and others start reading it, hmm right? Then it becomes a whole like, oh, you know, is that whole that pushback, right? Because, and I, I want the listeners to know you're going to have that, but don't be afraid because your voice is valuable. So what are your and thoughts that, on that? That pushback and, you know, listen, all the people in the back, that pushback is an activation. It's nothing more than an activation for you, for you to say to your source, your God, yourself, your universe, who you are again to defend who you are that's what that pushback is for and once you step into that role like once you step in and say well you know what you may not understand it and you may not like it but i own it man if you could see my face right the whole world opens up for you because you've just claimed yourself and the minute that you can stand in yourself and claim yourself that's what it did like you you claim who you are and relationships will come and go. But the one relationship that will always remain until you take your last breath is the one that you have with yourself. And the minute you're ready to start claiming and loving who you are, because if you claim who you are, you start loving who you are. It's 
the whole your whole reality changes. I'm so passionate. No, about I it. I love that we're talking about this because then then that leads to the other part that leads, and that's why you know I love my podcast because it's really about you know like we talked about that soulful self care. Like, what are you doing to fill your soul? And so as we do these things that we're talking about, those that are listening and watching. Things are going to happen. People are going to have, like you said, it's because you're finally coming out. And then, and then let's talk, let's talk about this, Mary, for a minute, because you kind of, you know, dropped a little, a little note a few minutes ago. I know that for me, um, I had to put boundaries around difficult family situations that people, and I talk about it on my pot. I talk about it on my podcast. I talk about it on my social media. I'm not shy about it because I want people to know that even situations around your own parents, you have to put boundaries on because, you know, we come into this world. So whether it's God, you know, whatever it is for me, it's God, but whatever universe, whatever it's called, the higher calling is for you. We don't pick our parents that, that, you know, for me, God's picked my parents. I'm always going to love them. However, pick your favorite sport. For me, it's football. If they can't play by the rules of the people that are on the field, those 12 men or 11 men on the field, then they have to sit in the bench. And if they still can't learn to play by my rules, guess what? The referee says you're out, you're, you're done. Get go, you know, sorry. And what's interesting, the pushback I've had on that, Mary, when you, when you talk about, when we put these boundaries, especially when it comes to family, they go, Oh, that's your parents. Oh, that's your sister. Oh, that's your son. Oh, that's your daughter. Right. And it's like, yeah, all those are true. But let me ask you this real question. If that person was a person I was married to and I was getting the same narcissist abuse, the same behavior, would you tell me to stay with that person? Like, seriously, you want me to stay in a situation? I mean, you know, I, I years ago, I, I call it divorce. I divorced my father. I mean, I gave him an obituary to being my father. I, I, t- I sent it to the family and I said, well, he's still alive. I, you know, he's, uh, he's no longer my dad. I don't need to know when he passes on. And, and if my family's listening, I'm just reiterating. And I have no shame in saying this because I'm very honest about who I am. And then, you know, because he did things that harmed my, my son, Matthew, he did things that would hurt my son, Matthew. And I'm like, he has to come first, you know? And then fast forward over the last two years, I tried to reestablish a relationship with my mom, who, by the way, she said, oh, by the way, she, I had reestablished a relationship with my mom because when I tried to reestablish, before I divorced my dad, I had let him live with me in my 40s, where my parents divorced in my 40s. And her take was, I was being disrespectful to her because I let my dad live in my home. I'm like, I'm in my 40s for God's sake, you know, what, what the heck? So, Fast forward, I'm trying to work this relationship. I want to build a better, I mean, she's my mother, right? But she could not get past that to the point that she would, she did things that would harm me that could affect my family and it could affect of where I reside the rest of my life, right? And so I was like, nope, this narcissist, and I literally told her, I go, this narcissist behavior, I will not let that energy in my home because that's not how I treat people and that's how not I choose not to be treated. Well, again, the pushback is when I say I've divorced my parents, they're like, but they're your parents. And I say the same thing. Look at your, look at the people. And I just went to a, a, a great training. They talk about the people in your front row, right? Those people in your front row, if they are not there to support, to lift you up, to say, I've got you, to ask the questions of you when you're standing in front of the audience and nobody's asking questions and they ask that first question and get the audience started. You need to reestablish where you're putting your feet at and then people in your front row. And for me, they're not in my front row. For me, I know at a young age of 17, moving on, you know, I went out on my own at 17. I know the path that I've been on is a path that was created for me. So, so to talk a little bit about that, Mary, I, you know, let's talk a few minutes because I know you don't have to get into what happened, but can we talk for a second? Like, how was that for you when you had to put boundaries around family situations? I mean, you know, like you said, you divorced after 20 some years of marriage. Like, I'm sure that brought up things too. So when you started putting those boundaries, how did you handle the pushback? So uh, I was angry at first with my divorce. Um, and I think I was ready to, at the time I had found, I had found a more soulful spiritual practice or connection to to god i want to call it external god just 
for my own because you know i believe that that i am is in me it's all inside of me uh but there was a lot of anger i needed to work through because there was a lot of just nasty comments uh i was subpoenaed for custody from my daughters who had spent most of their living and breathing life with me i was a military wife for 20 22 years and so most of the time he was gone i was head of household single parent and um, so there was a lot of anger and frustration that I had to move through during that experience, uh, which also brought me to the deepest level of learning how to forgive uh, and forget. Because here's the deal with, oh, you can forgive, but don't ever forget. What are you holding on to that wagon of bullshit for anyway? It just holds you back. So I, I had to go through that deep process and that deep process, again, I'm so grateful for it because it brought me to a wholeness of love because I can love everything about it. All the whole experience was a gift, but I did have to go through some of my own anger. I did have to go through some of my own despair. I begged for a mentor and all I got back was I'm making you the mentor, Mary, just hang in there. You know, I had pity parties. Uh, which I, I created my own little prayer and meditation in one of my closet. Every closet and every place I ever own now has its own special place. And I would set myself timers for pity parties. I mean, I would go through the whole works. I mean, here I was in a 25-year relationship over half my life thinking that the next half was just going to be fun and travel. And I was sadly mistaken. Um, so... I tried not to put up too many boundaries. I wanted to stay heart open. And so I worked through the experience with a heart really open. But I, again, I, I point everything back to my three non-negotiable practices. I just kept connecting to me. I put myself first. And what I also kept reminding myself up, my children, my, they, my children really ex had a, had a really need experience with this because I just don't see them. I feel energy and I don't feel that they have lived through any traumatic experience from this divorce, which is interesting and yummy and why they chose me because I didn't hold grudges. I let, I, I forgave because I did. I did this. They're courted to me. He doesn't even need to do it. And he probably hasn't. I did this. And the more I did this, the more I could see through them that they were, this experience was light for them. They they weren't angry. They weren't bitter. They weren't, you know, so I, instead of putting things up, instead of thinking that I was losing, I looked at it different. And I thought, there's a reason for this. I was far enough along. You know, I had gone through the panic. I had gone through all these other shifts. This was just another shift. Um, but it was a very important shift. And I will say this out loud and I have zero regrets. And I know that if that shift, if that 25 year relationship would not have shifted, I would not be this person that I am right now. And my children adorn me. Like they take care of me. <laughs> like, they look, they, they treat me the way that they've seen me treat others on their own. Um, I always talk about my youngest daughter who is turning 18 next uh, in June. And when I send her pictures, because I'm a way different mom, like I travel a lot and I'm not around a lot and she lives with her dad full time. And the other one, um, she's experiencing what as is possible at 20. But like when I send her part pictures, she's like, mama, you're so pretty. And I love you. Like you can, and I'm like, oh, this kid sees me. Because I didn't put up a bunch of walls. I, I just walked through it. I walked through it and I did the work that I had to do. I forgave and I loved myself more. And the more I forgave, the more I could love myself. And I chose myself. Um, and I taught my daughters the same. Like, you have to choose yourself. You have to choose you, whether people like it or not. But Pearl, the neatest thing happened that when my daughter, my oldest daughter, who's 20, turned 18, she went through an experience with her father that was very narcissistic like that. That was very, she was living with him full time and she decided that she didn't want to go to college. And her father and her stepmother had built up this huge thing about she needed to follow these steps. We talked about this earlier. 
And she's, she was straight A. She's whatever, all the kuma didn't lot of whatever. I don't even care about letter grades. Like I'm not even that mom. <laughs> and um, they looked at her and were like, we're so disappointed in you. And they started this disappointment, this guilt trip for months. And so they said, well, if you're not going, you're going to pay your car insurance um, as soon as you're 18. And she, okay, so she helped me with my mom. My mom had Parkinson's. My mom moved into my house. I was taking care of my mom. We paid Emily to come over um, because she was half days in her senior year and help move my mom and do some things for my mom. We paid her like a nurse. And so she had built up quite a bit of savings. And on her 18th birthday, her father took $3,000 for six months worth of car insurance. And that started the activation. She called me and she said, mama. And I said, okay, let me text. I, I'm not really on a communicating relationship with her father and we don't need to be. So to answer one of those questions about how things shift, our contract is done. We don't need to be. But I sent something and he cussed me up and down. And then he went upstairs and he yelled and screamed at her and punched the wall. And then her stepmom came up and said, how could you do that to your father? How could you tell your mother? So this whole thing exploded. She's on the phone with me and telling me this. And here I am, Pearl. It was a full moon that night, soul coaching my own daughter. And I said, Emily, and I'm telling everybody out there that, that experience these shifts because people are relentless when they're pissed off at you when you're not doing what they want you to do. I said, because they were keeping on. I said, they're going to keep on. I know how this human thing works. I said, you just look at them when they start going at you again. And I said, you look at them and you say to them, you are not going to make me feel guilty for following my own heart. And don't say anything else. When they come in again, you repeat it. You repeat that statement. Because they don't understand what they're doing. But if you use words that help them understand, because that's what they were doing, making her feel guilty for choosing her own life. And so this is, this is my experience because I kept doing my work. This is what I got to do for my daughter. She moved out that night. She moved out that night and they took her car away and they acted like complete just fools. And uh, the universe really, God, source divine, really moved in my favor. Uh, we shared my car for a month and then the universe afforded me to go get my own car, uh, which I've paid cash for my first car ever, which was one thing I was so scared of when I left my corporate. Like, what if I never have enough money to pay to get these kids their first car? What if I don't have enough to provide what the little things that I wanted to do for my daughter's? you know, that my mom did for me, not a brand new car, but just to have something. The universe started moving, man. I bought that car a month later. I bought another car. I had, it was me and two kids. I realized I had all the cars like, but that that's kind of what I did. I stayed committed to my, to me, to loving me, to my soul care. Every morning I still get up and connect every morning. I went moving to, to move the unforgiveness out of me to move these emotions out of me, to go through them, not to, to, you know, bury them, but to right. move through them and move them out of me. Yeah. I, so that, I, you know, and I think that's, that's so powerful. I, I, I just want to say like, I, it, when I'm coaching all the time, I always, especially when somebody has kids, I'm like, you are the example, you're, you're leaving the legacy of your kids and how they're going to behave. Right. I mean, even to the point that my my older son that we lost 18 months ago, he had a friend was over here for his birthday and his her, his little girl and she her mom, they're in the middle of this custody battle. Her mom put an Apple watch on her. And so when she was over, wherever when she wasn't with her, she would call her like every five minutes. And I watched her call during us doing a birthday celebration. And I saw this little girl's reaction of fear at five years old. When we got done with the cake and she's playing with her gifts and stuff. I pulled him aside and I said, listen. That there, you need to get in control right now because you are setting up this little girl to be so many different emotions. That's not fair to her because of, the, of what's happening with the mother, right? And for you to do that for your daughter, like to give her in the middle of that trauma to pour into her and give her that words, that's what we need to do as parents. We need to teach our kids when this is, especially like if we talk about bullying, like if we could teach our kids that when somebody's bullying you, to say things like that, could you imagine how that bullier is going to be like, the hell are they talking about? Like, what, what's that? You know, and then keep trying to get in your face and you just keep saying it. 
And when they don't win, they walk away because they 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 don't have the power anymore. You've taken the power away, and and that's like for me. I mean, just two weekends ago, when I was away to go visit my grandmother who has who's amazing at 86 years old she looks freaking great and she has cancer you would have never known she had cancer when i went to go see her because i found out she had cancer i was like i'm gonna go between my two trips and go see her my mother hears i'm in town and she's like she's telling all the family make sure pearl doesn't know and doesn't come here because i'm gonna call the police i'm like i don't need my energy like that get out of my space and i told her i'm like i don't need to know about that i have no desire to go see her she her behavior is her behavior and she just wants drama you know and and then she's telling everybody it's all her fault and my my brother uh, on another situation my brother goes how is it her fault she's like three thousand miles away like she doesn't talk to you she doesn't you know this is you did this action not her you know and so but you know so it's it's so powerful when we can pour in and put that into the universe for our kids and, and give them the tools and and you know what you're right college isn't for everybody my son did a year and he's like this isn't for me we're like okay just get a job do something you love and you're good right and so that's what he did so um, I'm looking at the time. It's we, we. It's it's almost like our time's almost up. I'm like going, holy gosh! This is. I hope you guys are enjoying this conversation because this is exactly where I love that this podcast is going. That <clears throat> that we're kind of evolving to this self care conversation about what we do and who we bring into our circle and who's on our front row kind of talk. But um, so tell everybody the three activations. I want to make sure they write those down. So you said daily connection, daily connection, daily movement. So whether it's just breath work or tapping or jumping jacks, five of them. Like all this is sec. You can do this in seconds and then celebrate. Pat yourself on the back. Pat yourself on the back. Mm. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy that you connected with yourself and did the movement. Like that was it for me for a while. Like I would, if I could just sit and, and pause for 30 seconds or wake up and say, who can I be today? Instead of what do I have to do? Right. That's a shift. That's a second. Yeah. Then I could get up and I could take three big, deep breaths. That's movement, baby. That's moving energy. Because I get all this. Like, I don't have time. Less than 30 seconds. And then you could just say, I'm so proud of you. You did it today. And then do it again tomorrow. Because life is all about what we do repetitively. That's yeah. life. That is the program. There will always be that, that main program. Whatever I'm repeating, repeats. Right. I love and, that. And, and it's so simple. And it's like three simple things, daily connections, daily movement, you know, and, 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 and what was the third one I'm missing? Daily connection, daily movement. Daily celebration. Daily celebration. Celebrating you. Yeah. Celebrating you with somebody else is even more powerful. Just like we talked about storytelling. Don't just say, I'm proud of you to you. Get on the phone and tell your friend you're yes. proud of you. Yeah. Get on with your community. Call your sister, call your daughter, call your husband, whoever. Like, I'm right. so proud of myself for being willing to create, you know, step into creating my own reality. I'm so proud of myself. Uh, celebrate things that you haven't before. Right. Or that, you know what I found, Pearl, and I'll say this last thing, because I know we have to wrap up. But one thing that we miss in life is, is that celebration. And oftentimes when we sit back and we say, why am I not where I want to be? It's not because we haven't gotten where we want to be. It's because we forgot to celebrate it. Right. We're still striving for something that is already part yeah. of our reality. Yeah. Even it, like, it's funny. It's that's, I love that you said that because even in, you know, like, I, I have two amazing boys and, you know, Nate's getting ready to get married this October. I'm so excited about that. We're having a, a daughter coming in our world, Amy. And then even like people go, you know, people's, you know, of course, when I mentioned that Matthew's past, oh, you know, they, they don't know what to say or they say, I'm sorry and everything. And I always say, I miss him, but I'm very honored that for 25 years, I can celebrate that I was his mom, right? I'm still his mom, but I can celebrate that for 25 years, we had this relationship, you know, and he had this this bond. And I think it's so important. I love that you said, celebrate with other people and we're going to leave it there at that. So what are you, what are you doing to celebrate with other people? I think that's so powerful. And then Mary, tell everybody how they can find you, how they can reach out to you. So easy fun that you can kind of relate to these three tips for your life and your business. If you just go to buzzing with brilliance.com, um, buzzing with brilliance.com, because that's what I believe that we're here to do shine so bright that we, you know, we're just brilliant. And, um, and we're going to put that in, this, in the, um, all that stuff in the show notes too. But you can find me on any platform as Mary Gooden, uh, M-A-R-Y-G-O-O-D-E-N. And I I've love got it webaddress.com, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Yeah. 
Cool. I love it. All right. So everybody, I gave Mary a forewarning. We have time for the cards. We're not going to let time go by without the cards. So I'm going to shuffle the cards and you're going to tell me when to stop, Mary. Here we go. Okay, stop. <laughs> All right. So, oh my gosh, I think I know the answer to this for you, but it, your card says, am I enjoying the ride? Oh, darling. If I could look you all in the eye and just imagine for a moment I am, this is the best part of life that I, I've i ever experienced. And for those of you, whatever you believe, I believe that I am. I have met my highest timeline of peace and joy and blessings. And I believe that we can all taste this, but oh, have I, am I? Oh, I'm the CEO and founder of my brilliant life. <laughs> there you go. See? So what are you doing to be the CEO and founder of your brilliant life? And I'm just going to say, if you're not sure where to go from there and find that, be that founder, I want you to go to WSLivingRetreats.com, WSLivingRetreats.com and come to our eighth annual pajama soulful self-care retreat. You just wear PJs all week long, no makeup. And we talk about some of these things that we talk about today with Mary and we pour into your soul and we celebrate you as well. So again, I want to thank you for being on with me, Mary. And for those that are watching and listening, remember you come into this world, you're a little rough on the outside, but as you open up your oyster, you do find your inner pearly greatness and become the shero you're meant to be. So have a great day.